Good afternoon. Thank you for coming out. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us for the first uh, seminar of the semester, uh, Infectious Disease Across Scales. Um, it is with great pleasure that we welcome Dr. Nita Barty to the seminar series. Uh, Dr. Barty is a renowned scholar whose interdisciplinary research transcends traditional boundaries merging epidemiology, ecology, and demography to shed light on pressing global health challenges. Dr. Barty earned her bachelor's degree in anthropology and astrology with honors from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, go blue. And her master's degree in biological anthropology from Penn State University. She also went on to obtain her PhD in biology from Penn State and subsequently became a postdoctoral researcher within Princeton's Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Dr. Barty's innovative approaches seek to uncover the links between human behavior and human health, as well as the interactions that lead to disease emergence, transmission, and persistence. Dr. Barty's dedication to scientific inquiry and her commitment to addressing real world, real world health issues make her a distinguished leader in infectious disease ecology, with her approaches having a powerful positive impact on the reduction and prevention of, of infectious diseases. We eagerly anticipate her enlightening presentation and the valuable insights she will share with us today. Without further ado, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Dr. Nita Barton. Thank you so much, Joey. I hope I live up to that intro. That was a really nice intro. <laughs> um, so thanks for inviting me. It's it's really nice to be here. I've already had a chance this morning to meet with some excellent students. Um, and I think this is a this is a really cool program from, from everything I've seen so far. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, the view from above and below and disease surveillance across scales, um, kind of because this seminar series fits with that, um, but also because I, I kind of think that's a, that's a good description for what I do. Um, um, so I use this really simple framework for a lot of um, the overarching uh, view of what I do. And I, I, I like the simplicity of it, but I like that it, it also, um, it's really useful for contextualizing any one of these three elements, um, these fundamental interactions in disease ecology. Um, in this uh, sort of triad, the way that I look at it, the environment can include a lot of different things, right? So it can, it can include what you think of as maybe like, climate, weather, or landscape factors, but it also includes cultural, social, political, and economic factors. Um, and those play a really significant role in um, a lot of disease ecology. And we measure all of these things with different metrics, each of these three factors, and across different scales. And that becomes important when we talk about disease ecology across scales. Um, I was asked to say a few things about how I started doing the kind of research that I do. And that's it was an interesting thing to think about because I don't know that I've ever really thought about how I started doing what I what I do. You just sort of you just sort of end up somewhere, I guess. Um, so uh, and I think it's easy to sort of retrospectively construct a really tidy narrative. You, you got to a place because you made a lot of very intentional decisions in real time, but since there's a lot of students here, I'm just going to say that's totally not what happened at all. Um, I did, so Debbie covered most of this, but the idea here is that I did a lot of random stuff. I worked in a bunch of different fields, um, and I have degrees that are sort of across social sciences and natural sciences. Um, and I think that that made me able to think about interdisciplinary problems and solutions, and to think about problems across scales. Um, and that picture at the top, that's the spirit of Detroit. It's the innovator from Detroit. We're best friends now. Um, and he's, he's wearing a t-shirt that says Anna Polio. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, so I think, you know, these are all the things that kind of shaped me and led me to where I am in a maybe not super linear way. Um, and I think having a broad background is a fantastic way to end up somewhere that unintentionally fits your interests. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about two stories today. I'm going to talk about human movement in Namibia, um, and we'll cover some things about representation in disease data and public health data, and mobility and access to care. 
And I'm going to talk about, hopefully we have time for fruit bats and their changing habitat. And this is a story about hendra virus emergence in Australia and how changing resources for flying foxes fit into that picture. Okay, um, so Namibia, this is the, the country of Namibia, and we work in the sort of northwestern corner. Um, and this is the team that I work with there. So Axel, uh, Alex Blake is a postdoc in my lab. Ashley Hazel is at UCSF, and she's doing a lot of anthropological work on these populations. And John Takarama and Jesse Matundu are Namibian collaborators um, on this project. And we are looking at human movement and access to care in vulnerable populations. Um, up in the upper right corner is a map of population density in Namibia. And it's small. The only thing I want you to note from that is that the dark polka dots are the areas of high population density, and the lighter areas are areas of low population density. So most of the country lives in urban areas. Most of the population um, of Namibia lives in urban areas. And outside of that, we have smaller populations, and um, they're sort of, uh, they're a little bit different. Um, so the population of Namibia is 2.1 million, and the country is absolutely huge land-wise. Um, and so you get these pockets of, of, of um, cities. It's a middle-income country. It has affordable health care, a really good health care system. Um, and the physical infrastructure, if you're in a city, is going to look like any other city in, in the world that you're used to, right? So sand roads, electricity, water, you, you would be very comfortable, and it would be very familiar. If you leave the cities, um, things get a little different. And so where we were in the um, upper northwest corner there is called Kalpa Land. Uh, the population size is unknown in this area, which is not unusual. We actually usually don't know how many people are in a place at any given time. Um, but this area is generally occupied by nomadic pastoralists, mostly from the Hima tribe. And it has very limited healthcare services. Um, there's not a lot of clinics or hospitals or, or anything like that. Um, and the physical infrastructure also looks quite different. So um, there's really no roads or pavement. It's dirt paths and trails to get places. Um, there's no electricity. And the water resources tend to be sand wells that are dug. Um, there are, I think, two solar-powered pumps in that region, um, but mostly it's sand wells that are dug. And it's a pretty remote area. Um, so that's the place where uh, we've been working for, for a while, and um, we're trying to understand kind of how uh, health resources look up here. Um, and so one of the things that we, um, that we know is that the immunization services tend to be mobile services. Um, the government will send a mobile uh, immunization unit up to this area and they'll vaccinate all the kids that they see in a town and then they'll leave and move on to the next town. Um, that may be a good strategy for a relatively sedentary population, but for um, highly mobile populations like nomadic pastoralists, that's not going to be um, the, the best way to target everybody, especially if you don't know what your denominator is, you're going to miss a lot of people. Um, and so what we're finding is that a lot of kids are moved repeatedly because that strategy isn't really targeting them or following them. Um, so we see recurring outbreaks of things like measles. Um, obviously, that would be uh, one of the vaccines that would be given in those mobile services. Um, but also, we see um, yellow fever. So we've been there during large yellow fever outbreaks, um, and people are not able to get vaccinated. And then malaria is also a bit of an issue here. So this is sort of an area where we see that there, um, there's room for improvement with infectious disease uh, prevention and management. Okay, so just to give you a sense of this, it's pretty dark, but this is what it looks like. Um, this is drone footage of the area. So here are some structures. You can see those. Um, maybe you can see those. You could see those a second ago. Um, the structures are like houses. Um, you can see these areas where there's um, a fence. That just means someone's claimed that land. So these fences don't have structures in them, so they're going to be used for subsistence agriculture. Um, this, this is really dark. Huh? So on the upper right, you can see a fence. Maybe you can see a fence with some structures in it. That's a housing compound. Um, you can see some like kind of really rough paths 
That's our white truck in the middle of the screen. On the right, you can see like a, like a dirt road path kind of thing. That's how you would get between some of these um, towns. Uh, but that's the area where we work. So that just gives you, hopefully, right, how dark it is, some sense of, not right, wrong, sorry, uh, some sense of what this area looks like and, and kind of what, what you might experience if, if you went there. Um, there's some um, consistent and important divisions of labor in this area. So um, uh, I mentioned that the Himba are nomadic pastoralists, so the men will tend to herd cattle and move around with them. So they're away for more of the year than they're at home in often cases. Um, and the women um, will sometimes herd goats. They're in charge of the subsistence agriculture and they're in charge of all the child care. Uh, and so um, that's a useful thing to keep in mind. So this is a place um, where it should be pretty obvious that the environment is going to have a large impact on movement and behavior because it's such an extreme environment. It truly is a desert. Um, it's a difficult place for anything to grow. It's a difficult place to live. Um, and we wanted to know how movement and the environment are interacting and how that's um, impacting disease transmission or access to healthcare, um, things like that. So um, we want to understand that and obviously access to healthcare becomes important for disease reporting. So if you don't have access to healthcare, your diseases are not reported because they're reported through a healthcare system. Um, so as we think about movement, there's a couple ways we can think about movement. And one of the ways we think about movement in infectious diseases is to think about the movement of infectious individuals um, and whether um, they are moving between populations or are they introducing um, a pathogen to a new population. This is often what we do with retrospective contact tracing or um, outbreak analyses. The other thing that is actually really important with infectious diseases is understanding the movement of susceptible individuals. Um, the population dynamics of susceptibles underlie the infectious disease dynamics of a population. And um, these can happen at pretty significant scales. And so the dynamics of the population will determine the dynamics of a pathogen laying on top of it. And so understanding the movement of susceptibles becomes very important. Um, this, again, this is very difficult to do, but it's important because we kind of need some sense, we need some context for health information um, or for epidemics to understand how a number fits into a population. So it's gonna change our assessment of a situation or our response, right? So um, what, is, what is your end? And, and, and that can vary a lot and it can have a huge impact on what you want to do. Um, and we don't often know this. It's also really important um, to be able to calculate the level of what you're gonna do, right? So if you have a, a vaccination coverage target, um, you kind of need to know what your population is. Well, what we found is that movement is changing this target a lot. Um, and, and the movement, particularly of susceptibles, is going to have a massive, massive impact on what your action should be or what your target should be at any at any time, or at the very least, how you would go back retrospectively and, and estimate your coverage. Um, and we find that these are often misestimated or overestimated because they're not accounting for movement. Um, and this becomes a problem. We get this quiet accumulation of susceptibles. And we've seen this um, for several measles outbreaks in places where we thought we were in near elimination, and then we ended up with a massive outbreak because we actually had just knock on the head of our susceptibles. Um, and as, as you probably know, if we look at population size estimates, they don't include dynamics, right? They might include some linear increase over years, but they're not including movement and they're not including um, shorter term dynamics and particularly seasonal dynamics. So one thing that we have seen uh, lately is that uh, mobile phones are being used by a lot of um, uh, public health services and, and governments to get a sense of where people are and where they're moving. Um, in Namibia, there's one phone company that has 90% of the market share, and um, they've been 
uh, working on kind of addressing issues of malaria and malaria transmission. Um, and so we kind of wanted to see how this would work in areas that are relatively underserved. Um, in the top uh, image, you see the, the network coverage that the phone company provides. And there, there's a, obviously there's a ton of um, really low coverage or no coverage areas. And one of the areas we're working in where we've been able to pay public health improvement is, is pretty underserved here. And so this repeatedly is thought to be not a huge problem. Um, people say that usership is growing fast enough and um, phone penetration is high enough that you're not necessarily missing um, important, you're, you're not missing anything. Even if you have low usership, you're not necessarily missing or getting misrepresented data. Um, so if public health officials are using these data to make decisions about where they're going to improve or how they're going to improve healthcare, we kind of want to understand if it's low or biased because if it's biased, it can be easily harmful. Right, you sort of create a feedback loop of people who are not included in data systems. Right, so just sort of quickly, if you have a population with um, three different demographics shown here in colors, if you have underrepresentation, you can scale it up. Right, so your orange areas are represented area in the data. You've got pretty even representation across these demographics, you can scale it up. If you have biased representation, you're going to miss completely um, some demographics. And so we wanted to see what was happening here. Um, because it felt like something that we needed to really rigorously investigate instead of assuming that it was fine. Um, and so we did that with the sense that, okay, mobile phone traces are not the same as human mobility. So mobile phone traces are going to tell you where phone, like who is using phones, where they can use them, where they're getting reception. And when they're using their phones to complete billable events. So you get this sort of subset of several subsets. And that's what phone data will tell you. And this is great in a place where all of those three elements are very representative. But if you're missing a bunch of people or some people or people you would maybe want to target with an intervention in any one of those three circles, you might be in trouble a little bit. Um, and so we went into Namibia, um, and we had been, uh, Ashley Hazel at UCSF had been um, at Stanford working on STIs in these populations, and we kind of went in and we said, all right, let's, let's see how well you would be represented in a mobile phone data set. And so we, we did a bunch of um, long-form interviews and um, tracking with mobile devices, um, and this is kind of uh, what you'll see in, in these areas, you'll see like a rock. So that's spray painted with NTC here. So if you go stand right next to that rock, you might get a signal. So we, we should be tagged, but we geotagged a bunch of these places. Um, and we basically tried to understand how people are using phones, where they're using phones, um, and how they're accessing healthcare, and how those two things matched up. Um, and these are informal locations, by the way, like the phone company doesn't tell you, like somebody figures it out. They're generally at altitude, right? You've got to kind of climb up a bit of a mountain to get these, and that's okay for some people, maybe not super accessible if you're sick or very young or very old. Um, so, you know, just kind of figuring out where these things are. And this is what our data collection looked like. Um, we would go to different uh, settlements and um, explain what we were doing to whoever was in charge and set up somewhere to do these interviews. Um, there's another side of this project that I'm not going to talk about today, but that we can discuss later, where we're actually um, collecting some virus samples um, to sequence viruses. Um, but we did all this. Um, it took a really long time to go from deciding we wanted to do this to completing uh, at least a few field seasons, because there were a bunch of steps in there, including IRB. Um, and the, the first paper we published about this part of the project was in 2023. The project started in 2013. So this is a, this is a, a long, long view. <laughs> um, yeah, don't, don't bend your career on something like this. Um, 
So what we found was that um, phone use, so this is that Alex, like, up back in my lab, did, did all this. He wasn't technically around for the data collection in 2013, um, but he was around when we were doing the analyses um, later. And what we found was that phone usership is low. Only 30% of the population is using phones. But it's also extremely biased. So um, it's mostly men that are using phones. Women are largely left out of phone usership entirely. Um, and that means they're largely left out of phone-derived uh, mobility patterns um, and, uh, and, and those data. So far, fewer women use phones than men. And the other thing we found is that phone owners move differently than non-phone owners. So if you're looking at mobility traces from phones, you're getting a specific subset of the population. In this case, they move more than non phone owners. So they look like they're more uh, mobile. If you were to take at face value phone data as representative, you would think you have a more mobile population. Um, so we asked people about, um, so these are the, let me explain this really quickly. Um, these are the, um, the curves show the density plots of um, the distribution of the number of destinations people said that they went to in the previous 12 months preceding the interview with us. Um, and the mean values are indicated by the vertical dashed lines. People with phones reported a mean of 3.5 destinations, and people without phones reported uh, a mean of 2.6 destinations. We capped these at five during the interviews. If we had let people go longer, we might have gotten a much bigger split, but we were also trying to locate these on maps, so we kind of limited them. Um, but people without phones didn't didn't fill up all five, basically, um, nearly as much. So people are moving less if they don't have a phone. So phone data already are not representative of um, the demographics of the population because women aren't, aren't using them, and um, they're not representative of people who aren't moving that much. The other thing that we found that was really interesting was that they're not representative of travel time to healthcare or access to healthcare. So people with phones, on average, report that they take 3.8 hours to get to a healthcare, a point of care. Um, and people without phones report that it takes them 5.7 hours to get to a point of care. Um, and that's just how much time they're traveling. Yeah. Um, is this already kind of just for men or just for women? This is everybody right now. That's I'll show you the splits in a minute. Um, it ends up, well, I'll just show you the splits in a minute. But yeah, this is everybody. This is the whole population. Um, and and, it, and it's, um, it seems like if you were looking at a population that goes to more places and can more easily access healthcare to make healthcare decisions, you might not be working for the people who need the improvements the most. Um, so if we split it up, so Katya here, if we look at um, the, the male female split here. Um, so the thing that we found overwhelmingly is that there's so few women who use phones that it ends up not being, there's not a huge gap between women who use phones and don't use phones. Men who use phones and don't use phones are pretty different. Um, but so few women use phones, but I'm not sure we really got a sample of how they are different if they're different. Um, so the um, label. Yeah, so the phone owners are in red and the people who don't own phones are in blue at the top. And um, essentially we see that the um, the male, the men in the population have um, significantly shorter travel times to healthcare if they have a phone um, than if they don't. And the women are not significantly different, right? And so the women who use phones are 8% of the population. It's just, it's so low um, that they're just missed from the data set whether they have a phone beyond um, kind of all together. Um, so if you were to say, we're gonna compare the whole population to just the part of the population that has phones, and we're going to look at their travel time to healthcare, which is what you'd be doing if you looked at phone data to understand this population. Um, the red lines show the phone users, and the purple lines show everybody, the phone users and the non-phone users. So that's everybody, the entire rest of the entire population. Um, and 
what we see here is that the mobile phone data are not representative of the full population and they um, underestimate the travel time to healthcare. Um, let say more about this because I don't think we talked. Um, so the intensity of the shades of gray at the bottom panel, that represents um, the size of the absolute differences of these step curves. And so if the value is above zero, it's, um, it's an answer that phone owners provided more than non-phone owners. And if it's negative, it's um, phone owner, non-phone owners have that more than phone owners. Uh, so one thing I'm not really gonna talk about, but that is obviously present here, is that not only are there gaps in the access to healthcare and um, the demographic use of phones in this population, but you're basically seeing whose diseases are getting reported, right? So if you're in the demographic that's not able to access healthcare, your diseases aren't being reported in disease surveillance data either. Um, and those could look pretty different too. So then we said, what if we take this a step further and try and look more at who we would capture and where in space we can capture them? We can assume favorably that everyone is always using a phone to complete a billable, billable event when they can be. So we're not gonna worry about that bias, but if we look at where and, um, and who could be captured in these phone data based on what we know about their mobility traces, this is what we come up with. So each row here is a town or location where people said that they went. On the left are the answers from people who own phones, and on the right are the answers from people who don't own phones. At the top in the green are places where phone reception is easily available. Um, the light green, or the medium green, I guess, the medium green is where phone reception is limited. So like that rock at the top of the hill that's an MTC here. Not everybody's going to use it, but let's pretend they could. Um, the live screen is places where people report that there's the live we report that there's no phone coverage and where we went and could verify that there was no phone coverage. Um, and at the bottom is places where people say there's no phone coverage, but we couldn't go verify it. So there's in all likelihood no phone coverage there. What this means is that if you're looking at data on mobility from these populations, you're only going to get the top two left quadrants in light gray. All the other movements are missing from your phone data, either because people who don't have phones went there, or people went there and there's no phone coverage. And if you don't have phone coverage, you can't ping off a tower. And if you can't ping off a tower, you're not in a mobile phone data trace. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we're missing not just people, we're missing a bunch of places. And a lot of these places are places where they're just not great healthcare. They're, they're very far from an access point. Um, so if we were trying to use phone data, for example, to preemptively limit the spread of an active outbreak or something, we would go to the places in light gray and we would miss everything in dark gray because we wouldn't know people were going there because they wouldn't be in the phone data. Those places are missing. Um, we had this list of 325 destinations from 91 non-phone users and 186 destinations from 41 phone users. And we think that's probably pretty representative of all the other places that would be in the lighter yellow um, in, in this region. Um, in the sense that there's a lot of people who are going to be a lot of people in places that are missed by these kinds of data sets, by this data set. Um, and so, what does that mean for us? Like, do we really, do we really just want to know about this one specific area? Well, yes, but we also really want to scale this up, right? So we can see how this would be a problem for outbreak response or outbreak prevention. If you're trying to send mobile vaccine units to a place based on mobile phone data, you're probably going to miss a bunch of people. If you're trying to do something with an emerging outbreak, you're probably going to miss movement patterns, right? And, you know, I brought you this 
maybe it's a slightly extreme example because of such a remote area, but I can show you this image of the, the um, outbreak origin for the Ebola 2014 outbreak. And it was, again, a really remote area that was underserved by um, public health and was relatively remote. And it was a place that didn't really have mobile phone coverage. And so when early efforts to look at movement patterns throughout this region relied on phone data, weren't very effective. Um, it was also at the border of three different countries, which if you've ever worked with phone data, it's problematic. Um, international boundaries uh, don't really link up in phone data. So you, you, people kind of disappear when they leave the country. So there's certainly important reasons to be thinking about not just low representation, but bias representation specifically um, for understanding what's going on in populations and how to improve health equity rather than ending up in a feedback loop where it just gets worse and worse because you're working with bias data that works against vulnerable populations. Um, so the idea here is that we want to be able to understand where these places are, um, where these places are, who these populations are. But we want to be able to scale it up. And one thing that's useful for this is some national data. And that's not that common. Um, but understanding how vulnerable populations are missed with sort of convenience data or maybe novel data streams, um, like more recently introduced technology. Um, and there's some things that we're starting to look at now to understand some of these patterns. So um, this is um, a picture of two different time points, two different ranges of time points of um, changes in routine measles vaccination. And the top panel is the difference from, 20, from 2000 to 2010, and things in blue got better. And the bottom panel is 2010 to 2019, and things in blue got better, but things in red got worse. So when we look at these national patterns, we miss a lot of these gaps. Some national patterns tell us something. Again, there's data biases in these data, but this can kind of help us understand where vulnerabilities are and how they're changing how we might want to look at um, different, how we want to look at different ways of getting data from populations and how we treat those things. So there's a, a balance here with being really specific um, to a local population and, and um, really effectively characterizing a specific population and then having some sort of flexibility and um, larger or broader applicability to other places, right? And then there's the expediency of remote metrics and the potential biases that are, that are introduced in them. And so as we continue to work on this issue, the main thing we learned was you kind of can't assume that your data are not biased. Right, just because usership is high or penetration is high doesn't mean that there's equity in it. Um, and simply by measuring and identifying the equity, we can actually do a lot better. Um, and some of that is accounting for local behavioral factors, and some of that is just recognizing that there's inequities everywhere. Um, so there's an interesting thing that came out of this. Um, we sort of looked at this digital divide as a top-down issue, right? So how are policymakers using these data and who are they missing? I was talking with a friend of mine at Ohio State who's working um, in anthropology, and he said, oh, it's funny, we're looking at the digital divide based on the bottom-up problem. So individual people who have this gap in access to information. And so if there's, um, you know, uh, a vaccine intervention and, and they don't know about it, they are not going to make use of it. So it's not necessarily an access issue. It might be an access issue, but that's not going to solve the whole thing. It's also an information issue. And so uh, I think that there's a really important way to be made here with the, with the top-down issue of policymakers and then the bottom-up issue of, all right, even if, even if policymakers are getting it right, people have to know about what's going on. They have to be able to have access to information. Um, and that was kind of the number one thing that, that um, that they had found was that uh, bottom up people just don't really always know about stuff if they're on the, the other side of this digital divide. Um, 
So our, our summary here was that uh, movement and contact patterns strongly influence disease transmission, control, and prevention, or in this case, um, they, they can have really direct, really strong direct and indirect impacts on hood behavior and, and diseases. Um, and we really wanted to measure, identify and measure data biases and not ignore them because now we're, we're kind of looking back at um, the beneficial, in some cases, adoption of newer data streams, um, but without calibration in some cases. And that's really where we think that the important gaps are. Um, and then we're thinking about what the data don't show. So now we know who's not included, places that are not included, and their diseases that are not included. And um, what can we do with that? How do we fill in some of those gaps? Um, so that's ongoing work um, and, and really understanding how those fit into culturally relevant solutions. And um, there's a, a, a I'll, I'll save it for later because we're going to run out of time, but there's an interesting story there about um, things that have worked in other places that would just not work in Namibia, in this part of Namibia, um, based on what people think is proper healthcare and what's not. Um, okay. um, we have a question from the chat. Oh, yeah. Uh, Vitaly asks Do these differences in distributions matter, e.g., what will be, be the impact on infection spread, et cetera, when misrepresenting the data from founders versus true? If this is unknown, these differences could be biological. Relevant. So I think they are biologically relevant. Um, I think like the easiest answer is if we're missing all the women, and the women are fully in charge of health care, we're missing all care of oh, child care, sorry, then we're missing all the kids, right? And a lot of the immunization efforts that come up in the mobile units are childhood vaccines, right? There's polio, uh, measles, um, you know, they're they're supposed to be, they're they're trying to be targeting kids. So they're missing a lot of kids if they're missing women. And that's a really easy way to sort of think about um, the, the really basic gaps that you might have if you're targeting one population and you're fully missing them in your data set. That's not a great match. Um, it's so I, I, I think that's kind of what she maybe means. Or keep going. Does that answer? Yeah. Uh, um, just to kind of build off that, I was wondering. No, so, so obviously kind of the mobile phone data are highly valuable, right? Yeah. And so, um, and I think it's important to kind of document these biases um, rather than just kind of the underrepresentation, right? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering whether there's kind of general conclusions that can be kind of drawn. So if you do your analysis with kind of mobile phone data and you look at malaria transmission in Kenya, let's say, right? Yeah. Um, uh, are there certain, um, you know, you reach certain kind of conclusions about, you know, vaccination rates that have to be in place or uh, whatever, right? Yeah. Um, so, so, Recognizing kind of the bias, you know, that there are likely biases, right? And that they might, you know, um, is there anything about kind of saying, so well, your, the conclusions that are made in terms of policy recommendations, um, that they are probably very conservative assessments rather than, I mean, so how, yeah. how, you know, are there any generalities that can be drawn yeah. along that line? Yeah, this is a really good question. Thank you for asking this because I kind of probably missed this um, when I was talking. So one thing we don't want to do is throw out phone data because it's really valuable. It's really good data. And a lot of times we think of it as, as a gold standard, whether it is or not is, is a different issue, but it is um, a very valuable high resolution type of data. And so what we want to do is um, use a multi-pronged approach, right? So we want to have the detailed phone data there, um, but we also want to be able to look at another, integrate another type of data that's going to maybe be more inclusive and less detailed. Or maybe it's a longer running data, right? So do you have census, survey, other types of maybe lower tech data that are gonna have different biases? So all data are biased, right? No data is perfect. What you wanna do is integrate data with different biases. So you fill in the gaps, right? And so that's kind of where, all right, so if you have mobile phone data, Maybe some survey will fill in the gaps, right? If you have maybe like some longitudinal data that predates um, mobile phone data, that might actually be useful. On its own, probably not. But integrated with phone data, maybe, right? So there's there's different ways you want to fill in the gaps, but that's really what you want to be doing is pulling together different types of data sets with different biases, right? These are these are essentially lamppost problems that, that we talk about, right? It's if you look where, where the, the, the lamppost is, right? If you look where you have data for um, explaining an issue. And so if you can set up different sets of lampposts 
you can do better at filling in those gaps. And those lampposts are going to be different for different places, but the idea is you want a diversity in your data sets. Does that, does that make sense? Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of what we're working on with Namibia, but also what we would like to be able to do in really a much larger scale. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so the other thing I'm going to talk about, maybe slightly briefly, um, is uh, we're looking at wildlife habitat and hangar virus dynamics in Australia. We're working on the East Coast um, of Australia here, looking at um, host environment interactions and pathogen environment interactions. And this is work being done by um, postdoc, current postdoc Mala Kulti Baranowski, uh, former postdoc in my Christina Fads, Peggy Eby, who is um, a bat ecologist. So she's been working on the um, ecology of the reservoir host since before the virus spilled over. She's a very different perspective of the system, and it's extremely valuable. And then Rhea Flowery, who has been working on heterograss for a long time, and she's the uh, person who kind of brought me into this system. Um, so quickly, the reason, some of the reasons that we're looking at, at heteroviruses, um, this has been on the WHO's list of uh, blueprint priority diseases since 2018, it's still on there. Essentially, this is a list that the WHO has produced that said, these are pathogens that pose a real public health threat because we're unprepared, uh, both from a research perspective and a response perspective. So there's a serious international health risk. Um, Heterovirus is transmitted from these large fruit bats at the top. Again, this is pretty dark. This is a black line box. They're actually very cute. Um, they look kind of like boxes. They have these sort of puppy like faces with giant eyes. Um, and they excrete the virus. And um, horses appear to be, for now, the only susceptible um, animal for direct transmission from bats. Horses amplify the virus, and they can then infect a number of other species, including um, humans, but uh, other farm animals and, and uh, other horses as well. So if you get an outbreak um, among like a horse stable, that, that can be pretty devastating. But um, when they infect people, it's um, a pretty high case fatality rate, and recovery isn't full. Um, so it's a neurological and respiratory disease. Animals that get it will be euthanized because, they, again, they're unlikely to make a full recovery. Um, and humans have a, have a high case fatality rate. It doesn't spill over often, but when it does, it's pretty ugly. So I'll, I'll say it again. It doesn't spill into humans often, but when it does, it gets, it gets pretty bad. Um, the virus first spilled over into horses in 1994, and um, it's, it's been on this um, east coast of, of Australia. So in dark gray, you see the, the range for the black line box, which is the, the uh, reservoir host, and um, in red dots, you see all the documented hemovirus spillovers to horses. Some of those have gone on to spill over to humans, but these are all the horse spillovers. Um, Um, bats have probably, the, the reservoir bats, the black boxes, have probably had this for hundreds of years. We just didn't see them until 1994 that we know of. Um, there is no direct transmission from humans forward, either to other humans or anything else. Um, but Nipah virus, which is a close relative, does transmit directly between people now. And so that's one of the things that um, is a I think a, a thing to observe um, of interest. Um, so what we largely think happens is that um, bats are foraging at night and they're feeding on trees. Um, they eat nectar uh, and they and they um, are important pollinators. So we have some important ecosystem services, but so they're going to find uh, trees that that have some nutritional resources. They're feeding on them and then they're shedding the virus um, into the ground below the trees. And they do that overnight. And then early, if in the early in the morning, um, horses come by and graze, either inhaling or ingesting the virus. That's how they uh, most likely get sick. And the virus is um, single-stranded RNA, so it's sensitive to UV rays, temperature. So you know, if you 
if you can prolong your course contact with the area below the tree long enough, it might not even be an issue. Um, but, but this is um, kind of what we think happens as far as uh, the transmission. And um, these bats are historically nomadic within the range, so there's different um, complications with understanding their abundance, um, their, their distribution, um, really too specifically. So we kind of know where we've seen spillovers and we kind of know where we've seen roosts, but um, there are a lot of gaps in really fully understanding where these animals go. Um, but one thing that is useful to know about hendroviruses is that it started in um, Queensland, which is this uh, northern state here, um, and then it has more recently moved into New South Wales. And so the, the red line is cases in Queensland um, over time, and the, the green line is New South Wales. So we hadn't seen it in New South Wales before 2006. And then, you know, we've kind of seen it um, much more frequently there since. Another way of looking at that is, um, so here, times weirdly on the y-axis in years and months um, across the x. But the blue dots show us um, New South Wales cases. So the earliest case was in 1994 at the top, and then you move down, and you have more um, emergence in this further south area in New South Wales. The other thing we know is that we see cases, we see spillovers more in the winter than any other season. There's a few ideas about why this might be. Um, Australia's winter months, right, so opposite of us, the Australian Wall Street winter months. Um, obviously, if you're feeding on um, nectar from blooming uh, flowers or fruit, winter might be kind of lean. And so there's an idea that maybe um, there's nutritional stress, and so these bats carry this virus, but they're nutritionally stressed in the winter, so they shed more of it in the winter. And that's why we see more spillovers. Um, that's one sort of thought. And the other thought is that spillovers are increasing in frequency because native vegetation is progressively declining. Um, and so maybe there's those two temporal patterns can be explained by nutrition stress, um, but we're not really sure. So start looking into this. Yeah, I've got one question. Um, you were saying a couple of times that, that, um, that uh, cases are increasing, right? But that's a cumulative number, right? So it seems to me like from the on the right, what it looks like is that there was kind of like a little epidemic wave, right? Um, yeah. You know, and then have gone down again. So there's blips. I think that the frequency is. I'll say it this way. So we have seasons where we get a lot of cases, but I think overall the frequency is much more regular than it had been when it first emerged and in the first few years. Um, and I don't, I agree with you. I don't think it's just like regularly increasing in frequency, but it's much more of a persistent occurrence now. It's consistent with the right block. You're seeing no, no great dots in 2022. Right, so, so it seems like it's really gone up a little bit. Yeah, so there's been some years, so the size of the South Delta, right? So there's a couple of really big years. Um, and then there's, yeah, so I think I think it is a changing system, but I don't think we're ever going to go back to only having one outbreak every five or 10 years. That's kind of not the path we're on. So I agree with you, it's not this monotonic trend towards more, but I do think something here is telling us we're, we're going to see this with some regularity. Where we hadn't in the past, and if these bats have had this virus for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, what's changing, right? Like, what is what is different, and, and what's important in the past 20, 30 years? Um, so yes, and I think this is part of the problem with this system. It's not super predictable. It's not super monotonic, and it's it's a very stochastic series of events, right? Like that Swiss cheese model. Um, but we kind of wanted to, to look at this, right? So what what is what is changing about the system, and what is driving the changes that we see? Um, and so Kelsey kind of um, said, yeah, let's look at the longitudinal seasonal hydrodynamics. Are these really um, what, what we think they are? Um, so the theory sort of in the field is that spillover occurs because there's this loss of native habitat and that reduces the availability of food for bats and that alters bat distribution and increases the overlap with humans. So is that true? So she said, how do we measure this? We want to know the extent of native vegetation and winter habitat and how it has changed. 
Um, and so these are the data sets she used to look at that. And we'll talk about them in a second. And then she said, well, and what is that doing to the winter distribution of black line classes? How has that changed? How has it changed? What's going on um, with those? And does that match up with any of the seasonal or longitudinal patterns that we think we're seeing? Um, so I'll start out on the first point by saying deforestation is, is a huge problem in Australia. Um, these are sort of the hot spots of deforestation in Eastern Australia is one of them. Um, and this is largely driven by human population growth. So you're seeing um, uh, human population areas of occupancy from 1992 to 2012 to 2018, and all those white spots are where people are. <laughs> Um, and the average annual population growth rates um, are still very high for Australia, but um, and this graph is showing us uh, 2006 to 2016. Um, this is a rapidly growing human population, not because of birth rates, but because of migration. People are moving to specifically the east coast of Australia where black lung foxes live. Um, it's, it's definitely not skyrocketing birth rates, right? So we have um, this land pressure where human population growth is concentrated in areas where flying foxes are foraging and where they're roosting. Um, the, let me just walk through this. So the um, teal circles are flying fox roosts and the purple pixels are areas of human population growth. So these are roosts that are occupied in the winter and these are areas of human population growth from the year 2000 to 2020. Um, and this area is a flow up up here. Um, but essentially, we're seeing a lot of, of overlap with where human population growth is happening and where flying foxes, black flying foxes live. Um, and that's that human population growth is what's driving the deforestation and not necessarily um, just for development, but to sustain um, human population. So mostly it's being lost to, to pasture and agriculture. Um, so a lot of um, native forests now look like this. Um, this is a video of a spillover, uh, an embedded property, a spillover um, farm where it's in New South Wales, it's very far south, it's technically outside of what we consider the black flying fox range. Um, and shortly, like I said, uh, after a, a head of our spillover event to a horse. Um, and there's all these black flying foxes flying over a farm in the middle of the day in what we would consider outside their range. So this isn't really what we expect from them. Um, maybe it's a, maybe it's a product of uh, displacement or lost habitat. We don't actually know. We just know that that's not really what we expect. We know that we're losing a lot of native vegetation and um, vegetation that would provide resources for flying foxes um, to deforestation. Um, so I'm gonna kind of get through this quickly. So Kelsey looked at some um, uh, serial data produced by the Queensland herbarium that looks really specifically at where um, native vegetation is and how it's been lost. And every two years, they measure this. And so she looked at um, different bioregions that had uh, black flying fox roosts that were occupied in the winter. And she looked at um, their uh, change in woody vegetation extent. Um, and she found that over a period of um, 20 years, from 2000 to about 2020, every bioregion had a net loss. Um, there were some clearing bans in place uh, because Deforestation is a problem here, and they worked sort of temporarily, but the, the, the net losses were still there. Um, and if we look specifically at um, winter habitat within those bioregions, not just woody vegetation, but specifically species that produce um, winter resources for the bats, there's just loss in every bioregion. And the, the clearing bands can reduce the rate of loss, but there's still loss. Um, so, uh, zooming in, we see that a lot of these um, sort of remnant patches or patches of um, uh, native vegetation that contain winter habitat are consistently lost. And so, as, as humans and bats are occupying the same areas, 
we're seeing increasing um, human vet conflict. And so even though they're important ecosystem pollinators and they, they provide these services, there's um, a, a fair amount of, of maybe undesirable side effects that go with that. Um, they are protected species, but um, it, it's not great. So uh, people will try and displace these roots when, roosts when they move into their neighborhoods. And this is kind of the messaging to deter people from doing that. And if you can read the other how small this is from the back of the room, it's not very strong messaging. It's kind of like, hey, we know we're annoying, but you're just going to have to do it. <laughs> we're not as annoying as we could be, essentially. Um, so it's it's a little bit of a, of a of a messaging issue also, and it's hard to get people to want to embrace these and see if this works. We'll be able to hear this. No. So there is a, a sound that goes with this where you can uh, this is a this is a neighborhood, um, and there's a roost in like the the large trees in the neighborhood. And um, it's pretty loud, even in the day when most of the bats are kind of sleeping. And so people don't really want this around. Um, there's a, a, bunch of, uh, a bunch of problems here, but one of the ideas for a solution here was uh, habitat restoration. So can we attract bats out of these areas, right? So can we draw them on their own will by, by planting something enticing. Um, and the, I'm gonna wrap up soon. Okay, so the idea is that um, the historic sort of uh, cycle for, for these bats was that they would be nomadic when um, food resources were abundant and then there would be acute food shortages and they would fission into small groups, and then when the food shortage ended, they would go back to being very large nomadic groups. Um, the um, solution here would be to like force this era, so maybe they're stuck here, and if you restore habitat, you can get them back to be nomadic um, large groups that aren't living in neighborhoods anymore. They're not living with people, right? So they're not going to be your horses and you're not going to have spillover events but um you so you, you know you get to plant trees and you get to reduce spillover risk and that feels like a win-win um but essentially we had to start with this idea that if that's going to work then it means that fat distribution and behavior indicate that they're responding to habitat loss or they're prioritizing your remaining native habitat so this is what kelsey wanted to measure um and there's a few she, she zoomed into the, to the bioregions and looked at these, but there's a, a few lamppost problems here that I want to point out. Um, so the areas in black, are, well, the, the pixels in any color are human populations. So um, these are kind of painted purple. This is not the best image, but you get the idea. Painted purple and black, those are places where people are. And the green dots are observed roosts. So we have a problem where we're looking at roosts when they're near people because they're easy to observe. Um, but if we take that at face value, um, you say we know something about roost occupancy. There's this long term um, monitoring program since 2007 that checks these roosts regular, regularly and tells us when they're there. So we know something about winter occupancy. Um, we don't know what, where they are when they're not in these roosts that are being checked. So we uh, decided to expand our land post. And we we stuck um, we stuck trackers to uh, a bunch of them. So basically, we gave them like burner phones. So we gave them trackers that would uh, hang off of cell phone towers for about two weeks before they before the trackers fell off. And so um, that's what our data looked like. And the main point here is that uh, most of the foraging activities that these bats are undertaking are occurring within ten kilometers of their roost. Um, they're not going on these really long nomadic flights. Um, and when they go from one roost to another, they're almost always moving between roosts that we know about and that are part of the monitoring project. Um, and some of them have really, really specific repeated destinations. They weren't necessarily going to what was the closest. They weren't necessarily going to what was the most wanted. They were just going to like, whatever, like the, the human the, or the bat version of like their favorite bar and then coming back, right? So they were just going to the same place every day. Um, and they, they don't go that far, especially in the winter. They, they really didn't go that far. 
So what's the intent kilometers of, of, of a roost? Uh, well, it's not uh, the, the really high quality native habitat. Um, they're not prioritizing that. I won't walk you through all these things we're going to be out of time soon. But essentially, we find that they're not choosing to roost near high quality native habitat. They're not roosting near what we would restore. Um, and they're not necessarily um, foraging on it either. Um, they're also um, so they're also not in places where there was formerly high quality native habitat. They're kind of just choosing to be close-ish to people. Um, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, but essentially, I think um, kind of what we're seeing is that we had thought historically that flying fox movement was uh, really, really responsive to these high value ephemeral food sources that were native vegetation. And increasingly, it looks like they are adapting to being near people. And so they're just eating different things. And so we kind of thought this may not be very promising for a restoration solution. It doesn't look like they're, they're be, they're, they would be drawn out to places with high quality native habitat if we replanted it. Um, it's probably beneficial for many reasons, but I don't think it's going to have the impact on this system that we want it to have. Um, we don't have, well, we don't have evidence that it would work. Um, and it would take about 20 years for anything we were storing to get to a point where it would produce what flying foxes would be feeding on. Um, so there's a good reason to maybe try to critically assess something that might be critically critically assess what the, the real benefits of a restoration solution would be and maybe look for something that would have a shorter term benefit for addressing some of these problems related to hendra virus and the human bat conflict. Um, so I'm gonna skip some other stuff and we'll we'll wind down. Um, Quick conclusions from um, Hendervirus that flying foxes are not moving or foraging as expected based on prior ecological studies. Again, a ton of changes in the system, um, climate, environment, the bats themselves. Um, they, they may very well have been moving that way. That might have been a good solution maybe 20 years ago, but it doesn't look like it's going to have an impact now. Um, all the data that we're looking at of flying foxes um, and the environment are spatially biased. Uh, most of the species identification that we're working with, that's really more accurate in places that people go a lot. Um, and so we're working on a satellite-based method to improve that classification in places where people aren't. So um, that's coming along just to improve the scope of what we know about this um, really vast area. And then just trying to better understand what's driving the slime fox behavior and movement to reduce the geographic overlap with areas that are can be spillover areas with horses, areas where there's a um, uh, human uh, factor. I think I'm going to stop there. Just put uh, some collaborators, funders um, up here. And yeah. So I'm wondering whether you have looked at, I know you don't work on satellite nighttime lights because it's not really biased to like gender and movements and all that things that seems like the mobile phone data is biased. So if so, how are we going to combine those two data and how are you going to deal with the double bias, for example, like Four families might not be able to light up so many lights, and also they might not be able to have a phone. So, how are you going to deal with that? And you thought that? Yeah, it's a good question. So, for the for the Namibia system specifically, right? So, um, so the the um, 
nighttime radiance data are certainly biased, and they're actually pretty useless in a place that is really low population density. So you actually don't see any of those settlements if you look at nighttime radiance. Um, so we we don't use those data from that area. So that's a, it's a great data set for like a kind of a sweet spot um, of of, uh, of population kind of size and uh, resource levels. Um, and it's like if you tried to measure population changes in Atlanta. You would, you would just come up empty, right? Because it would look really saturated, uh, even if the population was changing. Um, so there's certain kind of high and low end of, of elimination where you just can't use those data, or you would be really misled if you use those data. Couldn't use those data there um, for those populations. Um, probably those would be effective for looking at more of the urbanized areas of Namibia, but it would, it would really be um, kind of a, a misstep to use those in the the non-urbanized areas in Namibia, she wouldn't get anything, you just see zeros. Um, so what we're trying to do there is to use um, kind of much more uh, on the ground based measurements. Um, so one of the things that we've done to estimate total population size or maximum possible population size is um, get sort of grid drone coverage of the areas and uh, map out all structures and then estimate the maximum possible population size of an area of, a, of like a town um, that way. And that gives us sort of a guess for what your denominator might be if you were um, trying to run a, a vaccine, vaccination effort um, during like, like the, the max occupancy season. Um, uh, it wouldn't ever be perfect, but that's actually not a bad way to do it. Um, you can do some of that with um, like really high resolution satellite imagery, but it's not great because all the building materials, like for the roofs and stuff, are largely natural, and so they don't really pop in images. Um, it's hard to it's hard to see them. Um, so yeah, so we found drone footage to be useful for that, but it's not it's not as remote or convenient as some of the other kind of data sources that you might think about for um, visuals. Yeah, I don't know if that really answered your question, but yeah, with that work, we wouldn't use uh, nighttime radius data for a, a, a very low density population area like that. Yeah, that's a great talk. Super interesting. Um, I had a question about the Hendra stuff. Yeah. Um, specifically, when you're talking about how this like nutritional stress or how there's a lot of Hendra spillover in the winter, um, I thought that was interesting. I guess it makes sense from the perspective of the bat. But it's actually, I actually find it quite surprising from the perspective of the horses. Because um, I guess, like in Australia, the, a bunch of horses during their winter are here in the US racing. So, like, horse populations in Australia are changing. And then during the winter, presumably they're not foraging on grass because it's not growing. So, they're not going to be like under these trees. They're getting hay, probably. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, like, yeah. does that matter? I mean, maybe it doesn't matter. Like, kind of all. No, it totally happens, matters. But... So you're thinking of a population of horses that is significantly more cared for. Yeah. Right. So you're thinking of like the high value racing horses, they're all vaccinated. They're like in stables. They're not foraging or grazing under trees in the morning because they're like in a stable or under a roof. Um, and they're vaccinated. So I see vaccinated for their trials. There's a horse vaccine for Hendra, um, which could solve a lot of the problems, but as long as there's been vaccines, there's been anti-vaxxers. So as long as there's been a hendra vaccine, there's been anti hendra vaxxers. So that actually hasn't solved the problem in, in the way that we had thought it might. Um, uh, so yeah, so you're thinking of horses that are not in the susceptible pool. Okay. What we see, and this is a, a very different cultural thing between Australia and, and the US, there's like people have horses the way we have dogs a little bit. There's like backyard pony kind of just that's normal. And so people just have horses in their in their yards. And those horses don't necessarily have a, a, like a roof shelter um, that they would be in overnight. And so they might be sleeping under trees and waking up and just eating whatever. So there's a couple sort of really simple interventions that have been suggested um, in Australia for these kind of backyard pony horse owners. And one of them is um, just have your horses under a roof overnight, like put them in a stable or some kind of structure. Um, and the other is getting vaccinated. 
The vaccine is expensive and it is a series that you have to keep up with. So it's like every six ish months, you have to get your course vaccinated against Hendra and it's a, a pricey, um, pricey thing. And so it's, and, and frankly, if you live in Australia, I know like, okay, there's been like fewer than a hundred horse cases ever. Like if I'm not winning the lottery, my horse isn't getting hemp, right? It seems unlikely um statistically but you know this is this is sort of like, like are you gonna really spend what you would have won in the lottery but you didn't win on back moving your horse that's probably not going to affect so there's just some messaging i think that um and, and some interviews right if that vaccine was more affordable or more convenient maybe they'll take would be better um and yeah the horses you're thinking of are not going to get infected by them they're just not they have a better life Yeah, I have a kind of a follow up with the uh, the virus anthology. Yeah. So does it always, or maybe not always, but does it most of the time go through the horse, or can like a human get it directly from a like, bat or like, things like that? Um, um, it has to go through the horse, okay. and we think there might be something dosage related. So when the horses get infected, they really amplify the virus. They get like a ton of like. I mean, it's a respiratory neurological virus, so they get a ton of respiratory symptoms like foam and, and mucus, and that we think is really um, why it can then go to just about any other species. But we don't see Hendra ever go from a bat to anything but a horse. So for now, they're an obligate bridge. Um, and I don't know how long that'll be the case, but that certainly is the case right now. Yeah. Um, so how much is known actually about um, the viral population dynamics actually in the bats, right? Because if it's primarily, right, I, I don't know what happens to bats, whether they get permanent immunity, I'm very I, I have no idea, right? But if it is something like that, then you would expect only young bats to actually get infected, and their behavior might be different from the ones that you're tracking, right? So you have yeah. a bias, right? Yeah. So so what is actually known about um, viral yeah. population dynamics during bats? Yeah, this is a really good question. Um, this is work that Raina and Olivia have been doing um, between sampling and modeling, trying to figure out if it's um, SIR dynamics or SILI. So if there's a latent stage that they then go back to being infectious from, we don't actually know. Um, we suspect that, um, so we've done some under roof sampling where we try and see if we can find virus all the time. And what we think is happening based on the result of that is that we're more easily able to detect virus in the roosts in the winter se season, but that might just be that they're shedding it a little bit more, so maybe they're otherwise not controlling it that great during the winter, but yeah, um, we it's a struggle with the best. We don't totally know what's going on, um, but we don't necessarily yeah, I'll just say that. We, we don't really quite know what's going on. Um, there's one other thing that the rest of the Oh, yeah, so the trackers. Trackers are definitely biased. We put the trackers on bats that weigh over a certain amount, so more males. Um, and we put the trackers on bats that we think are not, that, that are definitely not pregnant, and so it's not going to interfere with cup season. So we have a side bias with males, and then we have a seasonal pregnancy bias towards males. So we're not capturing the, the whole population. Um, when we do compare male and female bats, it's pretty clear that the males are much lazier than the females, they're just not flying very far. Um, where they are. They're going to go through the bar. Any problems? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so you have some more meetings coming up in a few minutes. So we'll give you a few minutes. Oh, thanks again.